Jay Ken, do you want to start us off with the hearing here? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, okay, thanks. On December 14th, we uh, began a public hearing on three what's called relatively minor zoning ordinance amendments. Um, but we couldn't complete the matter because at that time we had not received comment from the Montgomery County Planning Commission. Um, I did see in the notes that as of a day or two ago, we still had not received a reply. We did receive them today. We received it today. Do you wish, to, I have not seen that, so do you want to share or summarize, was there anything substantive in their comments? Um, so basically they said the submittal is generally consistent with the goals and objectives established in the County Comprehensive Plan, Monco 2040, with the shared vision. Um, they, did, they did go on to say that um, with regard to the language proposed for parking spaces for single family attached uses, um, it says the proposed language in this ordinance states that no dwelling unit shall be more than 500 feet walking distance from any of its required parking spaces. Um, they say that it seems a bit um, ambiguous and further clarification regarding the terms required parking spaces. Uh, municipal officials could amend this section to stipulate that such parking spaces can take the form of private driveways or garages or common parking lots, provided that the applicant locates all parking within X feet of the dwelling unit served. Um, I'm not sure it's as ambiguous as they're saying. I mean, Norm, I thought it seemed pretty straightforward. 500 feet, I mean, if they're inferring that well, 500 feet, the shortest distance might be walking across private property, but you can't legally do that anyway. You know, so I, I, I would agree with you just as you had paraphrased it that I, I don't see anything. Okay, <coughs> so that was one comment that they had. Um, with regard to parking spaces for seeing single family attached uses, uh, Again, about this language being 500 feet away, it says it, it's unclear what the township wishes to achieve. Municipal officials should consider adjusting the required distance accordingly if the goal is to ensure that required parking is close to dwelling units. Um, so they're saying you could make it less than 500 feet, essentially, is one of the suggestions. I think part of this recommendation, though, was the expectation is that each townhouse would have one or two parking spaces attached to it or right in front, but then their extra parking spaces needed to be within 500 feet, like for guests or overflow, that sort of thing. So I feel again like it was pretty clear from the planning commission as to what their intent was. Um, so, what so that's the intent of the 500 feet. Like, where did that number come from? Um, I think it was to give some flexibility where that overflow parking went, so that it didn't have to be necessarily right at the unit, but there could, you know, be a distance so that you know, if the township decided that any new streets, let's say they don't have on-street parking, so then there would have to be an area for parking. It just, I think, it gave flexibility for that extra parking that was being required it, it also i think there was some discussion about the idea of not letting the developer to just simply plunk a parking lot wherever they wanted to if it was required parking which was necessary what we currently had in place just simply didn't seem to work and uh, Perkin crossing was a good example where we were hearing residents complaining there wasn't enough parking there wasn't enough parking because more and more you're taking your vehicles home with you if you're an electrician, if you're a drywall installer, whatever that would be if you have a company car. So what they didn't want to see is, okay, well, I've got this funky turn when I come in off of my access road. I've got this piece of property where it doesn't give me a setback to put a quad unit or whatever that might be. So I'm just going to put 50 parking spaces here. And all of a sudden, a quarter mile down the road is where that person is trying to walk to every day. So it, it put a limit on that to keep it close enough that it was a drivable distance. Could it go less than that? Actually, uh, that, that, that's fine. But that, that was discussion at the PC level, and uh, number 500 seemed reasonable to them. Yeah, because in the recommendation, it actually says 150 to 200 feet. It does, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It actually lessened it. Right, right. Yeah. And uh, 150 to, uh, to 200 is pretty close. It is. Pretty close. I mean, if, if, if the planning commission at the time felt less than 500 was appropriate, like a 350 or 400, 
sure that's fine, but the 500 doesn't seem unreasonable to me. And I would I would think that that if you are if we're at two and a half, and if you have that area that's the overflow parking, more than likely it would not be your daily driver. You know, it would be your weekend vehicle or whatever. And if in fact you drove your work vehicle Monday through Friday, you would probably park it at your residence. And then on Friday, you'd probably pull it in the overflow, hop in your other car and bring that back for the weekend or something like that, if it was that far. Right. So, and th they were the type of discussions that the PC had. Is there any chance that this could bite us in the reverse in that it's saying up to 500 feet and we're saying that, you know, it's assumed that there's probably one or two parking spaces at each townhouse within potentially a pull-in driveway or right in front of the unit, unit that they would prevent that and not put driveways in and make all the parking spaces like at some central lot that's within 500 feet of a front door? We're protected from that. The ordinance specifically says you, for each dwelling, you have to have a certain number of parking spaces. Two and a half. Right? Yeah. And yeah. so in this yeah. case, we're actually bumping it up to <coughs> two and a half parking spaces. But do they have to be on site? site? I don't know that we did. Lots. The one thing that we did do, though, is we said some. I don't know the exact language, but we did put in something in there where you basically you have to have direct access to a parking space. The developer is going to say, "Well, I'm going to park one of the vehicles in the in the garage and the other one right outside of the garage." And we said. Basically, you could not drive through a parking space to get to another parking space because inevitably, and uh, a perky uh, crossing type of situation is a good example. Warm summer day, you see the garage doors open more than likely. They're pretty full. You yeah, know, we're not caught. Yeah, exactly. And that was, that was one of the things that kind of uh, fueled the two and a half, going from two to the two and a half, and then also the not being able to drive through the parking space to get to the other parking space. And but, we, yeah, but just to <coughs> clarify, I mean, you still can have like a garage and two parking spaces in front of that garage. Let's say it's a two-car garage. You can have two parking spaces in front of it, but you would only get credit for two right. spaces. Right. Does that make sense? I'm just, yeah. since I don't have the whole ordinance in front of me, and these are only amendments, Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that this yeah, isn't no, saying that all two of your two and a half of your parking spaces that are allotted have to be within 500 feet and a developer tries to put a centralized parking area mm -hmm. right no and that's a from question. everyone's front door right because what you said is they need to be at the you know, two and a half of but I, that's what I, I'm not equating the two and a half to this 500 Right. The, the, where does it say that at least one or two of them have to be at and the front door? Yeah. 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 So I sort of defer to Tracy there as the manager yeah. well, and, and Norm, you know, who's yeah. your expert on the saldo, but I'm pretty certain that. Yeah, I believe the required at, at the unit is the two, and the two and a half would be you would only have to require that half a unit within 500 for the particular. Uh, well. Right, so like a 20 unit stretch would need 10 extra spaces exactly. and there Correct. would be a Correct. Mm -hmm, 10, Correct. that's our assumption how about how this, how right. we would but like we it have, to work. Yeah. I just want to make sure that that's how right. it and, would be and interpreted. And I don't have the rest of the code in front of me, so I can't order. verify yeah. that, right? And so that's, it's a fair question and Norm, if you're not absolutely sure, then I mean, we have Again, looked at the The whole reason that we came up with the half was we wanted to increase parking space and the 500 was keep it within that part of the dwelling unit. But I, to my knowledge and to my recollection, the, the, the two units still needed to be at that particular dwelling unit. And um, it, with the setback that's required to drive it, I, don't, I can't see a, a layout or a sketch plan that would come in that would not have uh, driveways to the, to the dwellings, mm -hmm. especially the townhouses, twins, whatever that might be. Um, so I, I can't, certainly I, I understand where you're coming from, the, the unique situation, but I can't, uh, I haven't seen or experienced a situation where they would, I'm not going to have parking at a dwelling. Uh, if anything, just from a marketability standpoint. Right. So we're going to buy a house that doesn't have parking. Yeah. If so, up sorry. Up to 500. Uh, I, I hear yeah. you, but. <laughs> so, but it's a, it's a fair question, and I'm, you know, I'm sorry I didn't bring the whole code out yeah. beforehand. I didn't know this question was coming up. Um, but I actually went to look for it and I couldn't find all the coordinates. 
yeah. online. <laughs> well, they're there. It's just kind of slow getting to them. Yeah. Um, it's so also an easier way to get at that. You know, you don't have to go to the township website. Mm -hmm. You can just Google um, Upper Frederick Township, you yes. know, Saldo, and there's something called Code 360. So all okay. all you know, this township's ordinances, not all of them, but there's Saldo and there's zoning ordinances mm -hmm. are available online. So you don't have to go through yeah. the website. I did just Google that and I put the ordinance in for Upper Frederick, but I didn't come yeah. up with it. it should Doesn't be mean there, I didn't need yeah. to do more searching. I think, <laughs> you know, I can show you. So, okay. so, but what I would say is currently the standard is 2.25 mm -hmm. is the parking requirement for townhomes. And whatever language we have currently is still there. I think um, yeah, this is just supplementing it. So I guess at this point, if you want the this 500 feet to be reduced, would you consider that a minor amendment? I would consider it less to be minor. Right? Okay. Yeah. So we could certainly alter that distance and and require well, I'm, them. To I'm not closer. saying change it. I was just suggesting to make sure that we don't right have some development. Now, I know what you're saying about marketability, but if somebody comes in and says, "Hey, I don't have to put driveways and garages at everyone's townhouse front door, and it saves a lot of money, and I can now sell them cheaper because I have a centralized parking lot," it could be marketable. Sure. I mean, um, I've seen it. It's a real concern. Yeah, yeah. Like people do that. They build developments and they don't. They have centralized parking. They don't have them at the door. Mm -hmm. So it's a real concern. Yeah. I just want to make sure. Uh, yeah. I'm fine right. with with updating the ordinance. I just want to make sure that. Yeah. And what I would suggest. That some of them are within. Yeah. And I think what I would probably sure. suggest is, you know, moving forward with these standards, and then we'll go back and we'll verify that at least two of them need to be at the unit. And okay. if not, we'll fix that. Because um, mm -hmm. I think it's a fair question. Yeah, you know, I think you know, we, we kind of go along thinking, well, the market would support two, you know, at least two spaces at the unit. But yeah, I mean, yeah, and I, I know somebody, somebody who lived in in just what were the concern is. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. sure, yeah. yeah, it's. I think it's also important to point out that whether it's zoning or salvo or stormwater, those ordinances are never 100 percent the way you want them, they're always in a state of flux. Yeah. And I mean, a good example is mini cell towers, solar fields. I mean, all these things that are happening that just simply didn't exist at one point. And this particular item, the reason the two and a quarter, the two and a half came up is, is that was discussion at the PC level. Um, that particular issue that you pointed out, Lisa, didn't, didn't come up. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I just, I, I wouldn't think it was an oversight, but it very well could. And looking at it certainly is not a bad idea. Yeah. Yeah. One minor fix, it doesn't solve the problem entirely, but in this language where it says and require parking for towns to within 500 feet, it could say require overflow parking, overflow and or excess parking mm -hmm. to be within 500 feet. So it would clarify you're, you're not talking about the two minimum spaces per unit, but only the excess. I do follow you. I just don't know if but, that But works. it doesn't completely fix it. it right? You still have to. Yeah, so I'd, ra I'd rather whatever. go back and just verify that it's not an issue mm -hmm. and then fully fix it if there is an issue there. Okay. It might not be a bad idea to put excess parking here anyway because then there'd be a little bit of a contradiction saying you have to put it, you know, two spaces, you know, for each unit, you know, adjacent to the unit itself. Well, but we but don't then, have any language that says two spaces necessarily adjacent to the unit. That's what we need. I think what it does, but I, you know, it sounds yeah. this fat. I, I haven't looked at that specific, you know, paragraph in a long time. But even if we go back and fix it and we say the two spaces have to be there, then this says, and require parking to be within 500 feet. That would be a little bit of a contradiction. You're saying, oh, it has to be here, but it can be within 500 feet. So maybe we should clarify that this parking within 500 feet would be for excess. That's fine. Doesn't seem like that would hurt. Mm -hmm. And we, we have mentioned <coughs> that I think the parking requirements are in zoning. That's why this is a zoning amendment. Okay. So just right. semantics. Part. Zoning is about that bad, too. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And, and it's quite, different for each zoning district. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, Tracy, before we vote on that, we're going we're gonna to fix the language in that? Well, it's a minor change. So we could actually, Ken could actually make a suggestion where he thinks excess should go into that sentence and you can just yeah. you can approve it um, subject to that change. Okay. And we can fix that. So 
still have a clean copy of the ordinance to be signed, but I would, would have to revise this and type it in yeah. efficient so you would execute it not tonight but after the fact. But you could authorize moving forward with these amendments. We're not done with public hearing yet, but right. you know, that's, uh, and, and this is an action item really later on the agenda. Right. This is an opportunity to explain to the public, you know, what's being proposed, it's sort of informational that way, and then also um, to, to receive comment or feedback, you know, with regard to these three specific changes. Then we'll conclude the public hearing, and then you can take action. Okay, later on down there. Yeah, later Okay. Right. Just so everybody knows the process. Okay. All right. So uh, there was a third comment. Um, they expressed concern about a section um, in the ordinance that uh, requires 20% of required parking to be permeable surface. So this is actually a provision um, that was in the original draft of the ordinance that the Planning Commission recommended not including. Um, so we actually have two variations for you, depending on what you wanted to do. Um, and Nora, maybe you can talk um, to some yeah. of your concerns about the Yeah, I, that, was, that was a big concern for me. Is the, the issue with the permeable paving, as soon as you have the permeable paving, uh, the developer is not going to want to include that in the impervious surface for their stormwater controls. Okay, and the permeable surface allows water to infiltrate through the pavement structure and into the base. The issue with that is the number one killer of, of your roads and any asphalt service is freeze thaw cycles. So you're encouraging water to flow through your pavement structure into the pave, into the, uh, the substructure and freeze thaw, freeze thaw, bust it up. Plus there's a maintenance issue. Permeable pavement surfaces are supposed to be replaced every 10 or 15 years. Nobody's ever going to do that. W what vehicle do we have in place to require that? Okay. And also, uh, the the uh, number one uh, cause for degrading an asphalt structure is oxidation, which is sunlight. It's not going to change whether you have a conventional pavement structure or whether you've got a permeable surface. So as soon as that starts oxidizing, what's the first thing a homeowner association is going to want to do? Well, we're going to get somebody in here to seal it. When you seal it, what have you just done to your permeable surface? You've changed it to an impervious surface, and then you don't have the, uh, the stormwater facilities to... Uh, to take in that extra runoff that's happening. So it, it, I just, uh, I would not recommend that at all. I think it's one of those, you know, uh, hip and, uh, uh, you know, catchphrases that, you know, a PC might throw out there. But the problem that you've got is when you go to put a road in, you want to compact that base. If you're going to try to have any kind of a pervious surface that you want to infiltrate through that permeable pavement and then below the substructure, you want to scarify it. You don't want to compact it. As soon as you start compacting it and closing the face off, you're not getting any infiltration. So they, they just, they go together about as well as oil and water, the ideas in my mind. You so, know. but Norm, what about an alternative um, to the asphalt, um, the permeable asphalt? What about like the blocks where they like put sand in there or vegetation or that sort of thing? Over time, you still wind up with the same thing. I get the example that I gave was about just about any road you drive out here, you've got a lot of farm country in Upper Fred. You've got farm access roads that don't even have road on them. They're used as an access road, and if they're driven enough, those, those wheel ruts or whatever, or depressions that have formed, will hold water. You're just compacting soil. So if you go and you put a, a Belgian block type of structure or a modular block, uh, uh, paving surface uh, for something like that. You'll put that down, and your your uh, sand mix is supposed to allow uh, water to flow through. It'll allow water to flow through at a certain rate, but if you get a heavy rain that we have, it's not going to it's not going to happen. What I've said before, and what we did, uh, what was actually proposed at um, Lords and Ladies right down here, is they were talking about doing a permeable surface, and I was like, no. It's just not good. And you saw what we dealt with with that particular business later when they started removing stuff and changing things around that we had to, you know, stop them to do. But what I said was, I said, just pave it conventionally, but in the center of it, put in an inlet structure with the no bottom. And you can go underneath that. And if you want to do stormwater, because if you notice, they've got a small basin off to the side. But that entire parking lot in front of the bay, their building, I'm sorry, is a, uh, it's an underground storm wall. 
constructed properly, you can do that. You go down low, you can scarify that, you can get infiltration, or you can create storage that goes out to the, uh, to the side there and routes the, routes the stormwater, but above it, you have a conventional type of uh, superstructure for a, uh, a paving that goes in. That's fine, because then when, when they have to seal coat it or whatever, we still have an impervious surface. Okay, but uh, again, and and it's whatever the township would like to do. But I've been doing, you know, roadway evaluation for a long time, and I just permeable paving just does not seem to. It doesn't work in my brain. It doesn't doesn't make sense long term. And so that is consistent with the recommendation of planning commission. They did recommend against yes. that. Yes. Sure that. Okay. So that would so. that then require additional because it would then not be impervious. It would be. Um, would require extra water retention basins or runoff or the other suggestion you just made at Lords and Ladies, like mm -hmm. underground. Retention they they would have to do direct. something underground. It would be treated like uh, like uh, any other impervious surface, yeah. Mm -hmm. And again, I, because of the way a permeable pavement is installed, I still struggle to believe that you're going to get any infiltration underneath mm -hmm. because you're going to have to compact that to get a proper substructure, and then you're going to put stone there, and you're going to allow or want water to sit there and infiltrate. And if it doesn't infiltrate, and you get your free saw cycles, the permanent pavement's just going to fall apart. I, I, I don't. I see it as a problem. And you know, sitting here now, and I've just got done with a project down in, in Skipback, evaluating for an HOA, and um, they're sold kind of a bill of goods. And now, as an HOA, they've got to pay to. You know, take care of that, and I just see that as a long-term maintenance problem for them. So, the the cost, the suggestion that you made, um, mm -hmm. is that more costly to construct with a longer <coughs> lifespan, or? Uh, no, I don't believe so. I would say your initial cost will probably be slightly higher, but <coughs> if you follow what you're supposed to do with the permeable pavement. You're supposed to literally remove that in 10 to 15 years and replace it. You're supposed to vacuum it annually. And it does not take <coughs> very long at all for that to become more costly right. than a conventional uh, payment structure. Yeah. Okay. So you back to the public hearing. I don't remember if uh, in, on December 14th I mentioned that. Um, the public hearing requires certain things. One is notice uh, in the newspaper of the intent to enact this ordinance. And just for the record, I want to make clear that uh, this proposed ordinance was published in the Pasta Mercury on November 28th and December 5th. So it means that uh, it's compliant with that. Uh, we're also required to send it to the Montgomery County Planning Commission, uh, which has been done with <coughs> talking about their response letter. Uh, and the other is uh, it either needs to be prepared by or approved and recommended by the Township's Planning Commission, which of course it has to. So I believe we've met all of the legal criteria you know, to move forward with this ordinance. And if there's not anything else from the board, I would suggest to open the audience to see if anyone has any comment. 